Welcome to Coastal, everybody. I um, hope everybody's had a great summer. No, apparently nobody had a good time. Okay. <laughs> That's a powerful way to start the class. Um, okay, so uh, I'm, I'm your uh, fill-in uh, instructor for the day. Uh, so um, I'm not going to do a huge amount tonight. We're, we're going to talk about some stuff. Probably won't go all the way till 3 today. Um, so as, as most of you may know, or some of you may know, um, so I'm on sabbatical this year, which means I'm doing research and stuff and traveling. Uh, I am around, but I'm not actually your chair for the moment. I'm not actually your professor for the moment. And so um, I wasn't planning on being here today. But uh, 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 Sean Berquist, who will be a great, great instructor, who will be your professor for the semester, um, he has a full-time job, works for Southern California Edison. You get to, you get to meet him. and. I don't know about his cool story, but um, he he had a he he runs restoration projects for Southern California Edison, fixes rivers, fixes wetlands, all that kind of cool stuff. And so he he couldn't physically be here today, so he asked me to just come in and just get us going. Um, so also with the new hires, um, it's taken us a little bit longer to get his contract official contract up and going. Doesn't matter anything for you. It just means he doesn't quite have his email address yet, so we can't get into Canvas and set stuff up. So probably in a day or two, things will be up and running. But, but just because that little hitch, I thought I would come and just make sure we're all started okay and all that good stuff. So, um, so I'll be here. I might be here a couple other times in the semester, but but I am I'm not your instructor. So any any anger or outrage or whatever can go towards Sean B, not Sean A. Um, but uh, it's great. Um, before we talk about the class a little bit, I'll just say, um, so I've known uh, Sean Berquist for a long time. He was an undergraduate when I was in graduate school at UCLA. And so uh, I, I've worked with him for many years on various projects and stuff in, in different uh, organizations he's, he's been associated with. He's also been a part of CSUCI before. So he came with us several times to our New Orleans trip um, and, and has, has worked with you guys. So he knows our program. He knows you guys and he definitely uh, knows the coast and he knows management in the coastal zone very very well so he's going to be a great um, a great opportunity for you guys to learn from so you don't have to hear me say the same thing i've been saying years after year after year he's he'll have some nice new blood for you guys and new perspectives um so having said that uh, i don't have a syllabus to give you yet uh it'll be coming soon you guys will have canvas canvas will be flicked on as soon as he gets his email address but right now he doesn't have anything so he's going to be sending out um, I just got them everybody's email addresses. Folks that are already enrolled, there's a couple people that are still trying to add, but folks that are enrolled, I, I got him your email addresses. And so after today, um, I can pick up the couple folks that need still to add, and I'll send those addresses to him so we can start reaching out to you guys this afternoon and this evening, um, and you guys can have his contact info. Um, so great. So having said that, let me first pass or start passing around this bad boy. So this is just what I, this was the roster as of this morning. So since I'm not the instructor, I don't, I don't have access to your roster, so I had to get this. So if you guys can just, if you're here, just put a check mark. And if you're not here, just do me a favor and, and put your uh, first name, last name, and, and email address. And just say, oh, I need an ad code or, or whatever the case may be. Cool? So I'll pass it around. If you guys could all please check or, or put your name at the bottom. Appreciate it. Um, the next thing is uh, he also asked me to get going our student, our student, our opinion polls which I know you guys love, Everybody, all this lore about opinion polls and how, how awesome and easy they are to do. So you guys will get to do that. It's going to be great. So we'll start talking about that today. But before we talk about that or anything specific about Coastal, we're going to take a few minutes, take about 10, 15 minutes here. And while, that thing's, while the enrollment list is going around, I'm also going to pass out these bad boys. So these are the first draft. They might change a little bit, but these are the, this is the first draft of our opinion poll. So um, I'm going to pass these out. Again, we have no rush today, so we'll take you know, 10, 15 minutes. Go through this and answer them. So you guys get the, pers get the uh, perspective of what it's like for you to be the person some bald dude walks up to and goes, hey, can you take this today? Right? And so, uh, so we'll talk about the logistics and all that. But first, I just want you to guys to take this. When you give this to people, what you say is, hey, uh, I'm a student at this class at CSUCI, and part of our class assignment is to is to get a sense of what the public thinks about some of the issues in the coastal zone. Um, so would you mind taking our survey? It's anonymous, and, and there's no right or wrong answers. So don't stress out. Don't feel like you have to know something. You can leave something blank. Um, you can say, I don't know. It, it's all good. So, so that's what you're going to tell people. It's not a test. It's, you're not like sweating them. You're not like standing over their shoulder, et cetera. 
So you're going to go to public places and pass these out. So I'll pass these out. I'll send a couple stacks around. And you guys can just send them to the back. And we'll take, you know, 10, 15 minutes. And then uh, we will. All right. Um, so let's get going. So go ahead and put those surveys aside for the moment. We'll talk about those in a bit. But I wanted to start off with is just sort of framing this overall class. Um, so we'll talk logistics uh, after this. But I wanted to make sure we all have the right context of um, what this class is about and what and the kind of the kind of things you guys are going to hear about this uh, semester um, so this class is about coastal marine particularly the coastal zone so what the heck is the coast so why don't we start out asking how coastal we are so show of hands how many people were born in a in a coastal county if not on the coast it's in a coast county so raise sh show of hands so, so, so uh, how many of you uh, spent significant time growing up in a coastal county? So, we do. So, um, I don't have the total enrollment, but that's a lot of people. So, last, last class, 78% of, it was about the same size class, 78% of you guys last fall were born in the coastal zone, or, or a county that, that touched the coast, and 100% um, spent some significant time growing up in the coastal zone. So you guys seem to be a little bit less than that, but nevertheless, um, the coast is a really important thing, not just sort of conceptually and all this and that, but in most of our lives. And, and now you guys are going to school in the coastal zone. So, so even if you weren't one of those, you're 100% gone to school in the coast, the coastal county, so that's you guys now. Um, so, so I'm coastal, so this is me when I was in graduate school. And I do all kinds of stupid things in the coast, like fall and put my hand through uh, masks. So I, I spent a lot of time when I was your guys' age uh, underwater and uh, mostly doing research with scuba stuff. But I grew up in um, a place called Pacifica, Daly City, up in just south of San Francisco on a cliff um, in houses that were super, super cheap back then. Now they're incredibly expensive. But back then, they're what my parents could afford when they were married. Um, so I grew up on the coast. Uh, this is my family vacationing in a lava tube. Uh, my dad is an artist and um, spends a lot of time with other artists, and he does stuff all over the place, but in particular, he does a lot of coastal stuff. So this is um, a sketch of him that Tony Bennett did, who, you know, I left my heart in San Francisco kind of guy. So there's all kinds of tie-ins to my family with the coast. This is my mom and her sister in what used to be a very poor area of San Francisco. Now it's also very expensive. but. Um, so my family, I have, I have long ties to um, the coast, grandparents, all this and that. Here's my son, two or three years ago, getting scuba certified. Um, in this case, this is a dive in Malibu. Um, and you can see these crazy houses that are up on stilts that probably won't be there in 20 years. But they cost as if they're going to be there for 1,000 years. But they're super, uh, super sketch. Uh, my uh, dad was in the Navy, my son, we've been going there the whole time. This is something that you guys won't know what this is. This is um, uh, the coast of San Francisco. This is this place called Playland at the Beach. We had a similar thing in Palos Verdes, other places in San Diego. Um, really the only one of those big sort of amusement areas, well I guess there's two, the Santa Monica Pier has persisted. The one in Venice Beach is gone now. There was one in Santa Cruz in coastal California, a big amusement park, but most of those have gone away. But this was uh, Playland at the Beach. This is almost all of my family worked here, like their first jobs when they were kids. They worked at the skating rink on the beach or, or something of that nature. So, so I'm really a composite of all these things. And most of us have these composites of, of food and music and all these things. And it really is amazing how, um, how high profile, even if we didn't grow up on the coast, the coastal imagery and the coastal thinking um, has penetrated our society. So um, a couple small things, uh, coral, coral reef, food like salmon. Um, this is a, a, a beer br brewed to help people do coastal conservation. This is an old ammonite, an old, an old fossil. Um, sea glass. Uh, some of my family collects sea glass and does art with sea glass. And they're, it's going away because we no longer make glass anymore. And so, so those beaches where they collect sea glass is getting fewer and fewer pieces of sea glass. It's all plastic now. Uh, more fossils, uh, F-bomb, because I swear a lot, um, uh, explore, uh, and all kinds of cool art. So, so diversity is really the norm in the coastal zone. I think sometimes you get the impression that it's, it's elitist or it's very uh, wide or wealthy or whatever, and absolutely the, there are enclaves of that, but really the coastal zone writ large has been super important to our species throughout the history 
of our species. Um, and it's interesting, um, so this is some political rhetoric about current goings on. This is a couple years ago. And so we sometimes see political rhetoric like this as someone's harming the environment or whatever, but it really is amazing how much of our general rhetoric, when people need imagery, they go to the coastal zone, they go to the marine and, and the, the edge of the continent. So in this case, this is, um, you know, talking about budget cuts and the folks could have talked about budget cuts about to whatever agency, but the imagery was, oh, let's have a, a ship that's going to ram another ship, right? Like most of us don't travel on ships all that often, especially cartoonists, but yet that, that's deemed a, um, a powerful metaphor. Um, same thing, in this case, this, this, was, this was from when our current president was being elected and all this talk of draining the swamp and the stinky, ugly coastal place and it's so dangerous and so fetid and so full of disease and this uh, savior is gonna come in and, and save us. So regardless of the facts, the simple thing that when we talk about swamps, when we talk about um, you know, piloting and things like that, everybody knows what we're talking about. Another, another case, in this case, this was about um, uh, a gentleman who's no longer in charge of the Department of Interior. Um, and, and again, the imagery of, of captaining and shipwrecking and all that kind of stuff is pervasive. Um, okay, so next, uh, how do we think about our coast? So um, coastal management is super complex. It's probably the hardest management out there with the possible exception of the conservation of flowing rivers. That's also extremely politically difficult. But the, the main challenge, as, as Sean will explain to you guys, is related to the fact that the coast is a, is a two-dimensional thing, right? It's a linear feature. Mm -hmm. And everybody wants to be on that one feature. Whereas if we're doing a forest, or if we're trying to conserve a, a, a grassland or whatever, and there's a problem here, we can, you know, we can scoot, at least theoretically, a mile over that way, or a quarter mile that way, or something, right? The coastal zone, Everybody is on top of everybody, and all the users, the consumers, the recreational folks, the, the, the folks that have homes, whatever, everybody wants to be in the same exact space, so it creates a huge spatial conflict in addition to all the other things that we know are challenging in terms of resource management. So i uh, start off with just a few examples of some things. Um, uh, I didn't put one in here, but I should have. Uh, so one of those songs I was playing for you as we were sitting here was um, a, an old uh, sea shanty. A sea shanty is, is like, um, is like a, 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 well, so it's a working song for folks that are basically slaves or, or close to it, indentured servitude, and they have to do all this stuff, same thing, day in, day out, and they would lose their mind. And so that, um, um, same thing with, with work songs in the fields, it's to keep you motivated. And, Yesterday was the 400th anniversary of the first enslaved Africans being sold in the U.S. So that's also part of our coastal history is this coastal trade that brings all kinds of benefits but also has had numerous dark sides and numerous uh, evil sides and all that together is part of coastal. Um, and, and just like there's all kinds of challenges, there's also all kinds of things on legal, illegal side that happen particularly in the coastal zone. So here's one. This is Prohibition Era Florida. Let's see if we can get the sound right. George Remus and Roy Olmsted were not the only Americans building fortunes by getting around the law. William McCoy, a Florida skipper, pioneered the rum running trade by sailing a schooner loaded with 1,500 cases of liquor from Nassau and the British colony of the Bahamas to Savannah, and pocketing $15,000 in profits from just one trip. Smuggling was not difficult. The 48 states had a total coastline of more than 5,000 miles, more than 35,000 if every tidal bay and twisting inlet Salty Creek and river mouth was counted. At first, the United States Coast Guard had only 55 vessels capable of patrolling more than a few miles from shore. Soon, scores of other seafarers were following McCoy's example, sometimes outfitting their boats with powerful aircraft engines so that they could easily outrun any Coast Guard ship. The trade transformed the Bahamian economy. 
when the United States government complained to Britain that American law was being undermined by Nassau officials, the man in charge of the British colonial office refused to intervene. Winston Churchill believed that prohibition was an affront to the whole history of mankind. From the tip of Florida, all the way north to the coast of Maine, a permanent picket line of rusting freighters, tramp steamers, and converted submarine chasers tossed at anchor just beyond the three-mile limit of U.S. jurisdiction. This chain of floating liquor warehouses was called Rum Row. Every evening after dark, fast-moving little boats carried cargo to drop-off points on shore. And people would go to the beaches on the south shore of Long Island or on Virginia Beach, on Cape Cod. You could see it. You'd just see these enormous boats. A person remembered said it was like at night, seeing the lights of the boats, it was like seeing a city out there. They were that thick. Bootleggers. They would dump cartons of liquor that floated somehow and then came ashore and then the owners would have been notified and they would come down to the beach and wait for the liquor to come in and it would be marked in some way that meant it was for them i know i had friends who lived on that shore who said if they got up early enough they could get the liquor and take it to their house and steal it from the man who was waiting for it Rum Row was busiest at what was called the Rendezvous, off the southern coast of Long Island, where New Yorkers in motor launches moved from ship to ship, comparing prices before deciding what to buy. It was like going to a supermarket, one schooner captain recalled. We had a good reputation and lots of customers. They would carry your mail ashore and bring you anything you wanted. So this notion of everybody on top of each other and conflict and, and commerce and what people want to do is going to sort of happen in, in the coastal zone. And uh, particularly before a modern era with all these sensors and things, it was virtually impossible to, um, to enforce. And so um, a lot of our coastal evolution happens um, in, in these ways. <clears throat> Uh, we'll talk about overexploitation and, and, and unintended consequences of some of our um, unsustainable management of resources in the coastal zone, like, like fishing and things like that, and, and some of the consequences that we're now documenting, uh, especially here at Channel Islands, uh, really, really well, unfortunately. Um, <clears throat> and this also doesn't just happen at the local zone or the, or the, the city of Los Angeles or county of Ventura level. There's also lots of geopolitics involved. So today, um, the G7 summit is wrapping up, and one of the key things there is essentially the, the mounting conflict between China and the US. And now, now typically, what we're hearing these days is about the trade war, about, about increasing tariffs in the US and increasing tariffs in China and all this and that. Um, and obviously, that has to do with the coast, because that most of those goods are traveling over the sea and coming in through our ports and harbors. But, um, another major, major conflict, another major, major challenge that we're seeing right now is, <clears throat> or in this case, a resurgent, a resurgent China. A hundred years ago, it was, a, it was a growing US, American empire, but, but these things come and go. In this case, we're looking at the South China Sea and areas that were not an island or areas that are very, just a little, like the size of this room type of an island, um, the Chinese have a very aggressive um, posture and want to control all of the, the sea next to them, basically. And so they've gone in and they've started dredging sand and dumping sand and synthesizing islands where there weren't islands, right? So never mind that it completely destroys the, the coral reef and all the fish and all that kind of stuff, but, but this sort of builds up land and then the Chinese military move in there and establish a presence. And because of um, this, uh, which you guys will touch on later in the semester, but this um, notion that was created by the US to exploit coast, coastal resources, this notion of territorial seas. Back in the day, when we saw all those, all those rum runners in Florida, the 
U.S. waters or a country's waters went out either three miles or seven nautical miles. Why? Because that was the distance a coastal mounted giant, you know, Gigante cannon could, you know, if you angle it up, could shoot and hit a ship maybe seven miles out, right? Any farther than that, they couldn't, they couldn't attack that, that vessel. So back in the day, that was the edge of our waters. After uh, World War II, the U.S. decided, oh man, we want some fish, and oh man, we want some, some mineral resources and some oil and stuff. So therefore, we created this 200 nautical mile definition that says our, our waters, our individual country's waters, go from our shoreline to 200 miles out. And so we created that. And now in the case of the Chinese, they're, they're trying to use that same approach and like, hey, yo, yo, dude, 200 miles, what's up? Right? And so, so <clears throat> again, all these uh, challenging things are caused by this constrained geography where everybody wants to be in the same zone. All kinds of uh, uh, manifestations of larger problems across the planet, things like climate change, in the case of the ocean, uh, growing acidification, growing warmth of the ocean, et cetera, are leading to significant um, die-offs of coral reefs around the world. My son and I were just in uh, the Florida Keys at, uh, earlier in the summer, and 80% of the coral that were there 30 years ago are dead. Um, so huge impacts, right? We're not talking about 1%, 2%, 5%. We're talking about major, major shifts. Right now, in the news the last week or so have been the, the um, current leader in Brazil, Bolsonaro, is um, inducing folks to burn the, ra the rainforest, and it's going up in incredibly fast. And so, so those global scale problems, we're seeing those manifest right here in Ventura County, partly because of our activities in Ventura County, but also because we share this global system. And, um, and coral bleaching and coral death and the loss of these coral reefs are but one example of that. Um, this is, this is a, a, a pictorial animation of uh, Miami Beach in, in uh, South Florida. And I'll play a quick story from here. So this is sea level rise. You guys might have heard about this in Dr. Patch's uh, oceanography class or some other classes, but we'll just watch a quick little news clip here. Continue our team coverage with CBS 4's Hank Tester, who's live on Miami Beach, which is not covered with flood water. Hank. Well, all those flood-prone areas here on Miami Beach, Rick, they're bone dry tonight, and all because the beach, very proactive, continual construction out here to raise the Super roads. Proactive. Let's take a look. Miami Beach at the ready, sandbags, pumps fueled and online. Newly erected seawall along Indian Creek, often the scene of high tide flooding. 25 million spent here alone, and so far during the current King Tide onslaught. So far, we haven't seen anything, which was, which was very nice. They spent a lot of money. They did, indeed, they did. So let's see if this pays off. 400 million spent citywide on the initial phase of the project, elevating streets at Sunset Harbor, the beach proactive, installing permanent pumps, shielding businesses from high tides and heavy rains that occasionally happen at the same time. This is the prediction from the Miami Beach Public Works. The real story is there is no story. The streets are dry. That was set at 5 o'clock. Later. Okay, it's 8.15. The king tide is in on Miami Beach. You can see it right here. Now, if you look over here, the seawall. If the seawall wasn't here, this barrier, the water would have flowed out into Indian Creek Drive. That's the highest I've seen it. These contractors on the ready, seeing that their work is, well, working, telling us that in two years, Indian Creek Drive will be elevated to combat flooding. Well, we're committed to spending between four and five hundred million dollars on raising streets that are just too low. The infrastructure just lower than Mother Nature wants it to be. We're literally raising them. And the beach had about 60 pumps in operation tonight, apparently. It worked. I'm Hank Tester, CBS 4 News. Tonight, back to you. Yes, great that they're trying to deal with this problem. I don't want to be pessimistic, but it ain't going to work. It ain't going to work, right? So that's, that's several hundred million for one small stretch of one city in one state in the U.S., right? So, so sea level rise, which is a natural process, but has been greatly augmented by our human activities, um, such as burning fossil fuels, um, means that low-lying areas like this um, aren't going to be here for a whole lot longer. And so when we were there in, in um, the summer, uh, 
super amazing uh, how do I say this um, a lot of folks don't don't get it yet shall we say it that way and right now it's mostly impacting these expensive areas right but it's now beginning to but it's just beginning to impact other areas of these regions right because sort of the, the wealthiest folks live in these high-rise apartments super fancy things right but as soon as those get flooded what happens is folks go and they move into areas with where folks don't have as much income right that have lived in those communities for much longer periods of time and have much more family, cultural, et cetera, ties to their neighborhoods, they're getting priced out. And so, so these climate change issues, these coastal management issues are, are environmental justice issues, they're, um, they're sustainability issues, all that kind of stuff. And um, some places like Florida, which is a dead coral, essentially all of Florida is a dead coral reef, they're, they're um, not doing too well. Uh, in places like Malibu, Ventura, right here we have some elevation gains. So there's, we can deal with this to an extent, but a lot of areas in the world don't have that luxury. And disproportionately, the folks that are the flattest, um, especially in places like Southeast Asia, those are some of the folks with the least economic resources to deal with refugees or, or moving infrastructure, whatever. And so this is a real um, major challenge that we have. Um, again, it's not just in, in super fancy places or, or whatever. This is Venice. Venice has been dealing with this for a long time. Venice is actually building a giant dike around the city of, around the lagoon that surrounds Venice to keep out the highest of the high tides. So massive engineering efforts. In some historically relevant place like like Venice, I suppose you can do that. We won't be able to do that for the vast majority of our coastlines of the world. Um, and this is a look at that, at the, uh, the big project. Um, there's lots of special interests, there's lots of powerful forces in the coastal zone. Um, and uh, this is a, a mocking when uh, Rita hit, uh, hit um, Puerto Rico and the president went down and threw paper towels and was like, we're all good, right? That, 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 that was a silly thing to do, right? Whatever your political persuasion, that was, that was pathetic, quite frankly. And, and to pretend that these issues aren't real issues and these coastal management issues aren't real things we need to deal with as adults and grapple with in honest ways, shape or form is, is the worst kind of head under the sand. Another example would be um, a couple years ago when there was a, a budget um, crisis in New Jersey, and this is then uh, Governor Chris Christie. Uh, so the beaches there, which are managed by the state, because they had a state budget shutdown like we have had here, right, and that we experienced um, uh, last uh, Christmas time with the federal shutdown. In this case, most of these beach areas are the access is controlled by the state, and they said, oh, nobody's there, so nobody can go to the beach, so nobody can go to the beach, but. The governor and his family were caught on camera out, you know, hanging out on the beach. And it was like, wait, I thought you didn't pass a budget, but how come you can use the resource? And so, uh, again, the, the clash of power in the coastal zone is, is more dramatic than in some other areas. Um, we really need objectivity. Here's a little example from uh, Puerto Rico. Number, a death toll vastly underestimated. The independent report from researchers at George Washington University reveals 2,975 people lost their lives due to Maria. The official government death toll had been 64. The power out for months, medicine in short supply. President Trump visiting Puerto Rico, tossing paper towels to those affected, and then declaring Maria's destruction was far short of Katrina. If you look at a real catastrophe like Katrina, and you look at the tremendous hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people that died. The president, at the time, speaking of the immediate death toll in Puerto Rico. 16 people certified. 16 people versus in the thousands. But even then, families across Puerto Rico, where more than 3 million American citizens live, found the numbers difficult to believe. David reporting from Puerto Rico on the eve of the president's visit. When I thought of it. Just 15 minutes from where the president held his news conference. Families with no running water, no power, the darkened hallways. Lisbeth Vasquez Delgado and her family, her aging parents, waiting for help nearly two weeks after the storm. We have heard that inspectors have been visiting some of these buildings all over Puerto Rico. Have you seen any inspectors? No, not at all. They have not come to see what has happened to these apartments. Not, 
No one has come. No one has come. And we asked, has anyone brought food? How much food and water have they brought? Nothing. Nothing. None at all. Stepping through doorways ravaged by the hurricane, Lisbeth's parents, Elmer and Gloria, have been waiting for medicine. This is the first medicine? This is the first medicine. And it's Motrin. ABC News returning to the island several times, outrage over how long it took for the power to return, and disbelief over that initial death toll, far lower than what many thought here. Just two months ago, we were back in Yabucoa. We've got that worker up there trying to restore power. The electricity had still not come back on. Do you feel like you've been forgotten? Yeah, we've forgotten. And tonight, Puerto Rico's governor now declaring this new number the official death count. David, as you know from your visit to Puerto Rico as well, this new death toll is what so many on the ground feared and believed all along. Now with hurricane season upon us, the more than 3 million Americans living in Puerto Rico are all too familiar with the dangers they face. David? So to deal with these challenges, and they are really real tangible challenges, we have to have facts, right? We have to see the world um, with, with honest eyes. Natural disasters, whether it's Katrina or or hurricanes or wildfires in the coastal zone, whatever, um, really lay bare our poor decisions or our poor planning. And so um, anytime a hurricane hits or an earthquake hits, whatever, there's, there's unfortunately going to be death and, and suffering. But the goal of good management is to minimize the number of folks dying, minimize the amount of social displacement, minimize that stuff. And that should be our focus, not sort of PR after the fact and saying everything is great when it's not. So real adults, real folks that are professional managers, love to hear their failings so they can address those failings and, and move forward and make, make the coastal zone more resilient and more sustainable and more just. Um, um, it, it is a dynamic place, and, and part of the, the newness of our coast is, is, is why we have some of our challenges, like uh, earthquakes and things of that nature. Um, and, uh, and, and some of our decisions have made things worse, such as the, the, the efforts um, in Texas to add more concrete to their, their whole state, actually, and actually make it more susceptible to flooding. So some of the damage we saw in Hurricane Harvey would not have happened if we had made some different, um, very basic management choices. Coast, and, and coastlines are dynamic wherever we're talking about. So uh, much of our part of California, we, have, we tend to have um, fairly up and down uh, cliffy type coasts. And so you guys probably saw this stuff, but just in the last two weeks. This morning, a popular surf spot in Southern California, now off limits. We have three immediate patients. This morning, a popular surf spot in Southern California, now off limits. We have three immediate patients, one minor. After a cliff collapsed. About the size of two vehicles killing three people just north of San Diego. The collapse happened without warning when a 30 foot by 25 foot section of the bluff located about 15 feet above the beach gave way, trapping people in the debris. First responders, including lifeguards on duty, jumped into action. Uh, we were able to rescue uh, five people from the rubble pile. Dozens of firefighters surrounded the scene as beachgoers looked on in shock. You could see them aggressively doing CPR in the back of the truck as really hard to watch. It's scary and everyone was very concerned. One woman died at the beach. Four other victims were taken to nearby hospitals and two of them succumbed to their injuries. Officials say the cliff was unstable due to natural erosion. This morning, the houses above the bluff are secure, but the beach below is still closed and beachgoers are reminded of just how dangerous the bluffs can be. People put their chairs and all their stuff up against these cliffs and they're not you know, conscious that these cliffs can slide. So this is all water. All these brown streaks are water from irrigation. So, um, so yeah, so, this, so sea, cliff, sea cliffs always erode, have always eroded since time immemorial, right? And uh, so part of that's just a natural thing. But um, when we put lots of houses on the top and irrigate those things because we want some nice lawn or whatever our, our idealized landscaping is, that actually tends to weaken these these sea cliffs more so than would otherwise happen. Sea level rise happening faster and faster, so the undercutting of these toes, so the, the, the bottom of this um, sea cliff is getting eroded, right? And, and um, there's signs all up everywhere say, hey, you watch out, don't get next to the base of the cliff, but it's, it's natural. You have a big surfboard and you're like, hey, so the folks that unfortunately were impacted in this situation, a gentleman was out surfing 
and I think it was his wife and his sister-in-law or some, something, they were, you know, hanging out probably where he put his board down for a minute or was doing whatever. And so, um, so the, this awareness of the dynamic nature of the coastal zone um, needs to be uh, higher profile. Um, we actually, this is one of our sites that we monitor. And so we actually didn't have our drones right over this. Our drones stopped about 200 feet from this, but we have a very nearby area that we've been mapping and looking at the movement and the erosion of these sea cliffs. Um, and unfortunately, we didn't have this area mapped. We didn't see how much erosion was happening on here beforehand, but obviously this is a large block failure. That was the day of. This here's morning, the day a popular of. Oops, sorry, here's the day after. You can move, you can move. Tragic and scary moments as this scene unfolded in Antonio. Three people dead yeah. after being crushed underneath that crumbling coastline that blocked giving out nearly 6 a.m. The lifeguards had shovels in hand, moving piles of sand to relocate the lifeguard station, which sat just feet away from the bluff. Now we're told this is still an active bluff, so the station was moved to ensure the safety of lifeguards in the future. Now I'm told the station will be in service today for the south end of the beach. Now beach rollers were standing near the bluff when it collapsed yesterday. Three people died from their injuries. Now the collapse itself was about 25 feet wide and extended about 30 feet from the bluff. Rescuers estimate the pile of debris was about 10 feet at the highest. Now in total, they say some 20 cubic yards of rock fell from the cliff. That's equivalent to several cars. Now the city recommends that beachgoers stay 25 to 40 feet away at all times, even so after- So 25 to 40 feet, those guys aren't 25 to 40 feet that are standing there, right? Mm -hmm. So 25 to 40 feet would be about at the end of, well. So um, when we make recommendations in the coastal zone, we need to make sure that they're realistic. So we could say something like, oh, I don't get within 100 feet of the cliff or whatever, and then maybe there's no beach to go to, right? So um, we have to always make sure that our recommendations and our guidance um, are in relevant language and in relevant, uh, with relevant signage and all that kind of stuff for people. Um, okay, uh, all kinds of other fantastic services um, um, are, we derive from the coastal zone. Um, some of you guys have been to our Hawaii class and some of, some of you guys have uh, at least seen this, if not participated in this. This is an um, example of a new type of ecotourism. So this is elasma brank or, or shark tourism. In this case, it's with manta rays. And it turns out manta rays are, are pretty interesting. So one of our colleagues at, at Cal State Fullerton um, that we do all our microplastics research with is studying how these guys feed and trying to, and using biomimicry, trying to replicate how, how manta rays that are fil filter feeding their whole lives and never, uh, never, lick their, never lick their gills or whatever and don't have to <coughs> cough to clean themselves. They just are constantly filtering little things the size of microplastics that we've been detecting everywhere, but they don't clog, unlike our human filters. And so they're really interesting creatures. Aside from that, uh, people started noticing um, 20 or so years ago that uh, this one, I'll play a, a, a couple minute uh, interview with this uh, tourism guy in Hawaii, but uh, this one light um, near the coastal zone, near, near um, that sort of shone in the water, uh, was attracting these manta rays. So what's going on is these manta rays are plankton feeders, right? they're filter feeders, and when we have a strong light source, 
a lot of our plankton, not all, but a lot of them are, are positively phototactic, so they swim to the light. So presumably that's an evolutionary response when they're kind of bouncing around the bottom of the reef here and the moon is out, the bright moon is out, they kind of swim towards the moon is, is probably evolutionarily what they're doing. But with us, when we turn on the light, the plankton all concentrate. And these fish are like, damn, there's more food there than there, so I'm going to go swim over here. And, um, and so this whole tourism industry has built up initially very much sort of catch as catch can and uh, person here, person there. But now it's become this huge um, industry. And so this is just off the Sheridan in Kona. And um, when, we, when I had my class there, so I took the ver this version of Coastal to Hawaii about three years ago. And, um, and we counted in this one area. And so this is maybe like if you picked up a rock and through the rock from the edge of the coast, you'd hit these boats. These are very, very close in. These are like 100 feet offshore, 200 feet offshore, very, very close. And I think in that one area we counted, I forget, like 67 boats. And each of them have a group of divers. Some are scuba divers that are going under the, uh, like, like go and kneel on the very shallow, like 15, 20 feet depth. But so they kneel. People that don't know how to scuba dive but snorkel will put on snorkels and go float like these guys above. And then folks that maybe are physically handicapped or whatever and can't do either, some of these guys now have glass bottom boats. So you can just sit in the boat and look down at the, at the what's going on. And um, awesome display of nature, super, super cool. Um, let's see. It's that they actually started doing it as a tour. Okay. Yeah. Because anybody can hop in the water anytime on their own and do it. And what I, what I had done, and this is my example of it, is in the early 90s when I moved to the island, Myself, I'm in my early 20s, and I had no money. They didn't do any tours. So uh, for some reason, it's too, too low. Anyway, that, that's the head of tourism for Maui talking to um, the coastal class. And that year, I can send you guys the link if you really care. But he just talks about for five minutes the history of this. Um, un and and, the, and the, biz the business owners love it. Because you guys all pay a bunch of money, and this is about 10 minute drive from the harbor, and they do it at night. So you get all these folks that pay a lot of money, get in your boat, you bum, 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 go out for 10 minutes, stop, dump everybody out, throw some lights overboard, and everybody's like, whoa, 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 for about half an hour, like done, boom, everybody back in the boat, motor back, and they're having dinner in like half an hour. So they make tons of money, they're burning very little fuel. Um, the, the tourists all have an epic, like, oh my God, this is a highlight of my trip. So it's ticking all these boxes, and so it, it, it doesn't seem to harm the, the manta rays. So it seems all good, except for now, when there was you doing it, that was cool. When it was you and you doing it, it was cool. When it was you, you, and you doing it, but now that there's folks on top of folks on top of folks, to me, it looks like a total nightmare. It looks like someone's gonna drive over someone with a, with a boat, and you know, it just, just crazy tourists, maybe had a little something, something before they went and got in the water, and just, um, um, uh, so loving to death, basically. The equivalent of loving these resources to death. So that's a challenge as well. Um, um, and, then, and then also just to say there's all kinds of awesome cool stuff in the coastal zone. Some of which you, you guys haven't really seen yet. But we have underwater lakes. So this is underwater, but this is a super, super salty lake. So underwater it looks like it's a lake it looks like a lake in the air, but it's a lake underwater. It's a brine pool underwater. All kinds of amazing things. Predators still exist. This is a grizzly bear. This is me tagging a grizzly bear. Um, but then we have all kinds of cool um, uh, culture also that has arisen all around the world. And I think we typically hear things about uh, you know, hula and Polynesian culture and stuff, which is awesome. But there's all kinds of culture all around. Um, that are, that, that's my uh, grandma in Hawaii um, just before the start of World War II. Um, and there's all kinds of cool mixings of cultures that happen as well from uh, folks from around the world that, that come to the coastal zone or, or different coastal zones mix, all kinds of neat stuff. So um, all right, so we're going to do a little activity now because I've been talking way too long. So um, one of the challenges that might be coming up is that, that all these elements together are a bit challenging. And so one of a, a, a theme that, that may well come up um, as you discussed this with, um, with Sean in class, is, is the coastal zone is really complex. One of the questions is, is it too complex to manage? So when we talk about all these challenges, um, uh, they can sometimes seem overwhelming. So to start with, 
Why don't you guys uh, turn to some buds. Let's get in groups of, I don't know, four people or so, four or five people. So sort of spin your desks and say, first introduce yourself, say hi. So everybody has to kind of move their desks a little bit, actually be, be active. So say hello, introduce yourself, make sure you say, say your name. Okay, has everybody had a chance to toss out some, uh, some names and ideas and stuff? You guys need a few more minutes. Okay, do we have some ideas? Well, we're going to start this side this time. How, how about you guys give me a couple of your, uh, or whatever your negative things are. I'll total all this up and do it. But from last year, this is what we, this is what we found. So in terms of the distribution of things that they, they, they liked most about the coast, uh, recreation and people's awareness and engagement with the environment, those were, those were their top things, right? And then we dropped down to, to, to these other uh, things that they uh, liked. Ne was this thing all the way down? Yeah, maybe it is. And then negative, ah, people, again, people. It's a common thing amongst you folks. And people suck and, and, and or too many people suck. Um, so that's, that's a big one. And then we're into things about, about distribution of energy and pollution and stuff like that. A lot of those elements of the poll kind of speak to these different aspects of stuff. Over, over exploitation, is this a good thing? Are you aware of this or what have you? So um, we're gonna take a quick break and let you guys to the bathroom for a couple minutes before we, before we finally wrap up today. But the purpose of this poll that we're doing is a, is a couple fold, one of which though is to get you guys more information. So you think the problem is people. People suck, right? Pollution sucks. Does, do our fellow citizens think the same thing? 